We are pleased to welcome Mr. Roger Birnbaum to our commencement ceremonies this morning. Mr. Birnbaum attended the University of Denver as an undergraduate in the early 1970s before being lured away by the siren call of the entertainment business, making movies and music. If you are a person who loves the movies, you know Roger Birnbaum. He started his career with A&M Records and Arista Records, names that people of my generation know well, before joining United Artists, where he was president of production. From there, he went to 20th Century Fox as executive vice president. He was co-founder of Caravan Pictures before founding Spyglass Entertainment with his business partner, Gary Barber. Spyglass produces, finances, and distributes motion pictures worldwide. Mr. Birnbaum continues to serve as co-chairman of the board at Spyglass, and in 2010 was elected co-chairman and CEO of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Most Americans know his films like Rain Man, My Cousin Vinny, Home Alone, Edward Scissorhands, Sea Biscuit, Invictus, and recently The Vow. Those and many others are Roger Birnbaum's work. His films at Spyglass alone have been honored with 34 Academy Award nominations, winning four times. Movies have been a central part of American culture for more than a century now, perhaps the form of art that most clearly reflects who we are and how we have evolved. Through his work, Roger Birnbaum has played an absolutely central role in that evolution over the past few decades, and for that, we honor him today. Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Denver, I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Humanities and admit you to all the rights, powers, and privileges pertaining thereto, in token whereof I present you this diploma and direct that you be vested with a hood appropriate to your degree. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our commencement speaker this morning, Mr. Roger Birnbaum. Thank you, Chancellor Kuhn, Provost Kuvistat, the Board of Trustees, and all the deans and faculty who are here today. Hello and congratulations, students. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here today on this wonderful campus. A lot has changed since I was here. Prohibition ended. <laughs> Women can vote. Say, is the stadium men still serving 3-2 beer? <laughs> it's a privilege to celebrate the accomplishments of the graduates today and to join them in thanking everyone who made their achievements possible. So let's give a round of applause to the teachers who inspired you and shepherded you through your education at this institution of higher learning. Next, let's give a slightly bigger round of applause to your families and all those who guided you and nurtured you long before you set foot on this campus. And finally, last but not least, let's give the biggest round of applause to your parents and anyone else who helped you pay for this education at this university. <laughs> Terrific. Now that that's over with, let me make something clear. This commencement isn't for your parents or professors. They're great, but I came here to impart my meager wisdom to the graduates, who today are closing one chapter in their lives and opening another. Of course, it's a bittersweet time. On one hand, you're embarking on an adventure, to start your careers and to decide what you really want out of life. I'm taking this off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I always colored outside the lines.、Um, but you're, you're deciding what you want to do with the, what you really want out of life. But on the other hand, you can't roll out of bed at 11 and head to the office wearing sweatpants. So now, in coming here today, I thought a lot about the lessons I've learned in the years since I've walked off this campus. This has been on my mind, and not just for the sake of the commencement speech. I have a daughter, just a couple of years older than you are, and I've considered what lessons I should impart to her so that when she ignores them, I can remind her. <laughs> I'm not even sure how to get through to your generation. You're what, 21? 22, your attention spans 140 characters. <laughs> Many of you are going through withdrawals because your phones are stuck under your gowns and you've been without Instagram for 20 minutes. <laughs> But I'm going to try anyway, and we're going to just focus on a couple of lessons. So let's get started. Now, I've had and continue to have an absurdly cool career in the music business. I've worked with bands ranging from Cat Stevens and Peter Frampton to the Bee Gees. I've produced dozens of films, many of which have actually been good. I'd list them, but I'm sure that when my name was announced as your commencement speaker, you turned to one another with excitement and exclaimed, Who the heck is that? So I'm operating under the assumption that I've been Googled. Today, I am the co chairman and co CEO of MGM, one of the great and storied Hollywood and film studios, founded in Tinseltown's golden era. Well, let me translate we make the James Bond movies. But while I may have achieved success in my life, of which I'm very proud, I did not come from wealth or privilege. Far from it. Few know this, but it's true. I was born in a strange and faraway place, a lawless region rife with corruption and mayhem. It's a culture with its own language and customs that few outsiders can even hope to understand. This place is called New Jersey. <laughs> well, all joking aside, I remember especially when things in my home were rough, and they could be very rough imagining my future. From a window in my classroom at school, I could just barely make out the Empire State Building and the skyline of Manhattan. I knew I had to escape. And I escaped. I escaped to the University of Denver. And it was a revelation. Growing up, I had trouble concentrating. Some of my teachers called me a daydreamer. If I were a kid today, they'd have put me on Ritalin and medicated all the interesting right out of me. But when I got to DU, having an active imagination, feeling pulled in a hundred different creative directions was liberating. But it was a good thing. I finally felt free to pursue my dreams, unencumbered by anyone else's expectations. Or doubts or negativity. And it was overwhelming. I had such a sense of possibility in my, in my life. So I dropped out of DU. I fled to New York. I'm sorry, but that's what I did. I never graduated from the school. Anyway, my first lesson is this don't be afraid to be a quitter. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> That's not my first lesson. But this is. The truth is, I left this school because I didn't know what I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. And I was looking to everyone else for the answers. I looked to my professors, I looked to my friends, I looked to the campus. And I thought, okay, maybe New York will have the answer. But it didn't. I got to New York and I realized the problem was me. And now, instead of being on a campus with a bed and a course packet, I'm in Manhattan with a couple of 20s in my wallet and a couch to crash on. A new zip code didn't magically fill me with purpose. That's the lesson. No one can tell you what to do with your life. No one knows better than you what you hope to achieve in this world and what kind of life you want to lead. If you don't know yet, that's okay. 
That's wonderful. That's being young. But don't wait for others to tell you. Don't wait for the answer to appear in a city, or a boyfriend, or a girlfriend, because it won't. Or worse, you'll be given the wrong answer. And the planet's many office buildings are filled with people fulfilling other people's expect expectations. Okay, so that was kind of a warm-up lesson. Don't wait for the world to tell you who to be. But then one day, you think you may know what you want, or at least you have a sense of what you want to try first. What do you do? This is the big lesson of my life, and it comes down to two simple words. I'm in. Now, I'm often asked how I got my start. People ask if it was being a page at NBC, or working for the music impresario Jerry Weintraub when he managed John Denver and the Moody Blues, or was it working for Clive Davis when he was launching Arista Records? But the truth is, my entertainment career began on this campus. I just didn't know it at the time. One day, my roommate told me about a student organization to which he belonged called the Board of Governors, which, among its other responsibilities, recruited music groups and speakers to perform on the campus. I accompanied him to a meeting, and it so happened the board was nominating a new president. My friend, for some unknown reason, nominates me. Someone else in the room seconds the nomination. And when asked if I accept the nomination, I reply, I'm in. Three weeks later, I win. So now, I'm in show business and loving it because I'm booking bands to perform at DU for a bunch of drunk college kids. Anyway, now we're back in New York and I'm a dropout. But I'm walking along the street one day and I run into a fellow that I met while attending DU. He had been a manager for a group called the Persuasions that I had recruited to come to the campus. But by the time I met him again he, in New York, he was an executive at Capitol Records. He offered me $120 a week to become his assistant. I was torn. I had just landed a junior job at NBC that I was very, very lucky to have. I didn't know what to do, but something told me, Roger, it may be risky, but music is where you want to be. So I said, what the hell, I'm in. All of a sudden, I'm helping this guy find bands, I'm listening to recordings, I'm deciding what I think is good. In other words, I'm making it up as I go along. And one day, I'm excited about this new band I heard. So I go into my boss's office, but just as I'm about to play the tape for the band, he stops me and says, Roger, I got bad news. I've been fired, so that means you're fired. This was like three months after I started. I left my job at NBC to do this. I'm screwed. I'm in had backfired. So I went to the band and I broke the news. I never got to play the music for my boss, and there was no contract for the record label. But they weren't really phased. They had a little powwow and they said, well, you like us. Why don't you be our manager? I replied, sure, I'm in. Now I was a manager. Only one problem, what the heck is a manager? I, didn't, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm 21 years old, and I've got to find this band a record deal. So I do the only thing a proud and enterprising young man could do. I panicked. But somehow, we got a meeting with one of the legends of the music industry, Clive Davis of Columbia Records. This is the guy that discovered Janis Joplin and Bruce Springsteen. This was big time. Have you guys ever heard of Janis Joplin? <laughs> I'm seriously asking, because some of you were born in the 90s. <laughs> so here comes the big meeting. I bring in my little ragtag band into the room. At this point, they're playing in basement bars and back rooms. They perform live. My hands are shaking. They finish their last song. No one says a word. And then Clive Davis signs them on the spot. That was it. That's how I got my start. And all it took was saying yes. All it took was a willingness to take a chance on a band, or a job, or a career that could end with success, or with me back on a couch in Brooklyn. And I'm not going to BS you. People say that you shouldn't be afraid of failure because it makes you stronger and you learn from adversity. And sometimes that's true. What I'm going to say is this. 
The reason you cannot be afraid of failure is because the alternative, not taking a chance on yourself, never being open to new opportunities, will mean that you avoid smaller failures in a way that adds up to one big failure, not doing a thing. Failure is inevitable, but when you choose to take a chance, when you go for it, you set failure's terms. Win or lose, it's your call, and that's way more interesting. Later in life, this philosophy is what led me to jump from a top job in the music industry to take a chance on producing films. And for a while, that looked like a big mistake, too. One year, I was on a yacht, not mine, with Mick Jagger and the Bee Gees. The next year, I'm begging people to let me produce an after-school special on bulimia. It took me years of grinding effort to produce my first real film, and even then, it was an uphill battle to make it anything less than awful. But slowly, I made my way back. Eventually, I landed a job developing films like Batman, with Michael Keaton, not Christian Bale, and Rain Man, and a lot of other movies you think of as classic old films, which is so very depressing to me. <laughs> movie by movie, some good, some bad, some blockbusters, some flops. My business partner and I built a business from the ground up, which became one of the leading entertainment companies in Hollywood called Spyglass. And we did it by saying, I'm in, over and over again. Roll the dice, you get the sixth sense. Roll the dice again, you might get the love guru. But we were not afraid to take chances. We weren't afraid to take a writer, or a director or an actor who might be strange or risky and give them millions of dollars to make something cool with our cameras. It boils down to this. Adventurous failure is way more fun than mild-mannered success. I want to close with a third lesson. And the truth is, it's dark for a commencement. When I was your age, I had a dear friend, a very, very talented guy, who died as a result of a random act of violence. And at his memorial service, one of our mutual friends gave a eulogy. What he said shaped my life. In part, it was because I was raw and stunned and vulnerable. Sometimes to hear good advice, you need to be ready to hear it. Even just to listen, we need to be willing to take a chance. He said, whenever I was with Peter, he made me feel like I was the best possible version of myself. That was it. It was a small thing, obvious in a way, but it rattled me. Am I like that, I wondered? I made a decision then and there that I was going to avoid negativity or sarcasm, that I would actively pursue a life where my friends, my family, and my colleagues would never feel anything less than encouraged by me to reach their potential. I've thought about that every step of the way, that to be anything short of excited and engaged and optimistic in this world is just dumb, childish, and small-minded way to be. I'm sorry for being blunt, but I mean it. The truth is, none of us can avoid life's pitfalls. We stumble, we get sick, we get in car accidents, we're victims of violent crime, we oversleep for job interviews, we accidentally burn the roast. There are a million things that will stand in the way of your success. You don't have to be one of them. You don't have to be one of those people who forgets how lucky they are just to have a chance to try. There are plenty of negative people in this world who take their opportunities for granted or who miss them altogether. And there are plenty of people who think this life is a zero-sum game, that others have to be torn down so that you can get built up. But they're all wrong. You are so lucky. The world is ahead of you. And if you're willing to take responsibility for the life you want, if you aren't afraid to take chances and throw your hat in the ring, and if you are generous with your love and your support and your kindness, if you make others feel that they can do anything too, well then, you can't fail, can you? Because that's what it means to be a success, to say, I'm in to yourself, to the possibilities in this world and to the colleagues, friends, and loved ones who will join you along the way. That's it. Those are the three lessons. I hope they serve you well. Congratulations to our graduates and their families. Oh, oh, oh. 
And if you want to invite me for a beer after the ceremony at the Stadium Inn, I think you know what I'll say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berenbaum. That was truly inspiring.